Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Toronto Apologetics. It's uh, great to have you along uh, tonight or this morning, wherever you are on planet Earth. We welcome you, and uh, we encourage you to uh, subscribe to the channel, Toronto Apologetics. Subscribe, like uh, the uh, the video tonight, the episode that we're going to be engaging in tonight. And uh, thank you for, again, just for giving up your Friday night to be with us. And uh, we just uh, trust that this will be uh, an, an edifying uh, program uh, for you. Um, Toronto Apologetics, as, as, I, as I usually uh, mention in the opening of every episode, is dedicated to the uh, defense of the Christian faith. And so we deal with various topics. We deal with topics related to politics, to comparative world religions, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc. deal with various uh, groups, uh, new religious movements, sometimes called cults, and uh, we deal with textual criticism. Uh, sometimes you deal with the, the Old Testament, sometimes you deal with the New Testament. And so we're dedicated to giving answers, uh, equipping uh, believers in Christ uh, to give answers to those who ask of us about the hope that we have. And so tonight, I'm, I'm very delighted uh, to have back uh, on uh, Toronto Apologetics uh, a dear brother and, and friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Douglas Petrovich. Uh, Dr. Petrovich, thank you so much for being on with us tonight and welcome again. My pleasure, Tony. It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me a second time as a guest. And if I can just throw out a little tidbit here, uh, not to put you on the spot, but since you mentioned uh, textual criticism, it just so happens that lower textual criticism is the area of focus for my Master of Theology thesis. And I wrote my thesis on the question of uh, how did Ephesians 1.1 originally read because the prepositional phrase NFSO, which means in Ephesus in English, yes, um, is not found in all of the oldest manuscripts. And the question is, um, is it original? Is that prepositional phrase original? If it's not, how does the text read? Does it read logically? And um, if not, if it's not original, what are the implications for that? So if there's ever a time where you would be interested in um, discussing that topic with me, I would, I'd love to. Uh, Absolutely. Learn. Absolutely, Doug. That, that's also one of my areas, uh, my favorite areas is textual criticism. Yeah. And so <clears throat> definitely I'd, I'd love to have you back and to discuss uh uh, not just Ephesians 1 1, but other text critical questions sure. like Absolutely. the comma Johannium, 1 John 5 7, and even the longer ending of Mark. We can discuss that. Mm -hmm. Pericope, the adultery, the woman caught in adultery, John 7 53 to John 8 11. So, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for offering up there, uh, Doug. So, mm -hmm. um, so tonight, uh, Doug, I, I wanted us to, to discuss uh, the book of not just the book of Genesis, but the whole the narrative. Uh, of Genesis, obviously contained in the book. And I understand you were involved in a documentary, um, I think along the same lines about is Genesis history. Can you say yes. a, little bit, a, bit, a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And it's kind of a fun story. Um, so uh, apparently the way it worked is uh, there's a Christian filmmaker. He's in Nashville to this day. His name's Thomas Purifoy. And he has a great heart and a great mind. It's amazing. Um, the, uh, the gifts that God has given him. And he had a daughter at the time who was in, I don't know what grade it was, June, let's say junior high or somewhere in that vicinity, up or down. And she had a class where they talked about these issues. And basically her teacher was kind of ridiculing the um, creationist approach to um, the origin of the universe. And um, that kind of prompted concern in her. So she went to her dad and said, Hey dad, um, you know, how do I deal with this in school? And he said, you know, that's a great question. How do we deal with that? Right. So that just led him on a, um, safari, if you will, through the, the wilderness of, um, how can he answer the questions that apply? And so it kind of just got bigger and bigger as he went. And next thing you know, He's just shaking all the trees, looking right. for people with a PhD in an area that would apply to answering the question, is the book of Genesis historical? And mainly we're talking about uh, the first 11 chapters yeah. with even a greater focus on the first, you know, um, several chapters. So um, and, and the flood to, you know, six to eight. 
Um, so a lot went into this. And so he had several, um, so he found and got commitments from scholars all in, in his one requirement is you have to have a PhD in your field. Right. And he got several geologists, an astronomer, uh, a microbiologist, um, a marine biologist, um, you know, a, it, it just this long, long laundry list of people with, with training in specific areas that couldn't contribute to the question. Mm -hmm. And I was the only um, archaeologist invited to be part of the film. And what happened with that is Thomas somehow got in contact with Dr. Bryant Wood, who's my archaeology mentor. And he said, hey, Dr. Wood, uh, I need to find somebody that I can get on uh, the film who, who focuses on uh, the Tower of Babel. Has anyone done research that, you know, Mm -hmm. He or she would be certain about um, some things related to that. And he said, oh, yeah, I've got the perfect guy for you. And um, so he connected me with Thomas. And, of course, Dr. Wood knew that I took a year-long Mesopotamian archaeology course at the University of Toronto in, in the last year of my Ph.D. Um, coursework. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely loved the class. And um, it just so happened that in the class I learned that there were two outward movements of people from Mesopotamia in the prehistorical period. And why is that important? Because Genesis 11, the events that are there, the Tower of Babel and so forth, pretty much has to occur in the, in the prehistorical period because nowhere do we have in the ancient world the codification, written form of the universal language that predates the Tower of Babel debacle, right? Right. So that being true, then the movement of people has to happen still before we have the, the full-blown advent of writing. So in that course, I learned that there are two outward expansions of people in the prehistorical period. One of them is, is in the Ubaid period, and one of them is in the Uruk period. And, you know, for me, I mean, it's like, it's like uh, you know, um, tic-tac-toe. It's so easy um, mm -hmm. because of the course I took and, and the studying I was able to do and the professor I studied under who was one of the world's leading authorities in Mesopotamian archaeology. Do you mind um, me asking who that was? Um, yeah, Clemens Reichel, if you know the name. Okay, yes, yes. Clemens Reichel. Yeah. And uh, German originally, but mm -hmm. fluent, you know, in English and probably another language or two. Okay. Um, and a fantastic archaeologist. And he did excavation at a site called Hamukar, which plays into all of this, uh, into my research too, for this question. So for the course, I wrote a paper on um, the, oh, comparing and contrasting the Ubaid expansion and the Uruk expansion, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't even make one biblical, put one biblical reference in the entire paper, because I knew if I did, then, you know, mm -hmm. I run the risk of failing, of being failed. Because, you know, you can't connect this to the Bible kind of a thing. Just this, this predisposed perspective. And I don't know with Clemens Reichel if he would be so strong in, you know, along those lines. But I know several of the other U of T profs would have been if, yeah. you know, if it would have been they um, in that situation. So I, I, I decided I'm going to go stealth here. And so I just wrote the paper strictly comparing and co contrasting the expansions with the intent that maybe in that research, I'll, I'll, I'll track down enough data that I'll be able to know which of the two expansions fits with what I call the post-Babel ex, expand or the post-Babel dispersion that happens yep. at the end of the story in Genesis 11. So um, oddly enough, there was plenty of information that I came in contact with. Um, so much archaeological and you know, work has been done and other research on written sources that I ended up with a really um, kind of meaty paper that um, that drew out these comparisons and contrasts, and they're very different expansions. and And long story short, the Ubaid expansion pretty much is extremely implausible when you think what must have taken place at mm -hmm. post Babel dispersion. Right. And the Uruk expansion has everything you'd expect if that kind of thing were to take place. Mm. Interesting. That's fascinating. So, so when we talk about Genesis, as you know, Doug, it's a very controversial topic for for Christians. Uh, unfortunately, 
Uh, many of them, as you know, uh, there's old age creationists, there's young earth creationists, um, there's an intelligent design movement. They're not all Christians, but there are some like Stephen Meyer. Um, and then you have, of course, theistic evolutionists like William Craig um, and, and others, of course. Um, and we usually hear that, that Genesis, uh, particularly the creation account in chapters one and two, are, are allegorical, they're, they're not meant to be taken literally, they're poetic, um, and, and usually the cutoff point, as you pointed out, is Genesis 11. So many of them would say, well, real history begins with the calling of Abram in Genesis 12, uh, and everything before that is kind of an uh, ideological um, uh, composite uh, literary structure to tell us why things are the way we are. Why do we wear? Why do we dress? Why do we put clothing on? Why is there marriage and etc. and so on? So uh, what I find interesting, of course, Doug, is that in, in your work, um, you're kind. You're kind of the. Uh, let's just say you're not in the majority of the so-called big thinkers that that assume that Genesis is 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 not literal and 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 only only an, a non-academic would would take it as literal, but. Can you maybe talk towards that? Because the the, the biblical writers, obviously, uh, even James Barr admitted it, and I believe uh, John Day has also admitted that that the author of Genesis one to eleven expected his readers to read it literally. That that they really believe that this was a true account. That they were not using, they were not presenting this as some type of a myth, uh, mm -hmm. or or as Craig calls it, mytho historical. Um, maybe you can talk towards that, uh, Doug, because um, this is an area where a lot of Christians get really confused because do we go with the theistic evolutionists that God used evolution to bring about life species over millions and millions of years and that Adam was just a, a hominoid that showed up later and that God breathed a soul into him. Uh, he, he became an insult creature. Maybe you can talk towards that. I know it's a mouthful, Doug, but uh, I think it's so important. Sure, you're right. It is, Tony. It's very important. And it's hotly debated, as you know. It um, it, it becomes a, a flashpoint. It becomes a, a, you know, a Maginot line that's dividing people. And uh, um, th there's a lot of heat that's generated with this whole topic. So um, I, I guess I'd begin by saying um, I am a young earth um, advocate. And yes, that puts me in the minority in the overall academic sphere. Yeah, and Probably I'm, in, I'm in there as well, Doug. So you I, want to? I'm Good. in company with you. Okay, so at least at least we have two on a hand, right? But yeah. <laughs> we, there are thankfully there are others. There are plenty of others. Yeah. Um, but we are in the minority. Um, the good news is that the people that we probably are able to reach the most with what we do and what we say um, are sympathetic toward our view and open to our view. That's that's the nice part. Um, because um, we, you know, we take the Bible literally. We, we believe that um, in the original manuscripts in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, um, those original texts are co-authored, unlike any other writings in history, meaning you have a human author and a divine author working in harmony and tandem yeah. to, um, to somehow communicate um, without error God's revelatory thoughts about things that are important to him that otherwise would not be um, understandable or, um, you know, weren't, weren't otherwise disclosed to mankind apart from God's kind of breaking into human history and letting something about himself be made known. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you know, we are on that same page and I am a, an, an, um, a young earth advocate, which, um, yeah, that, that's the, that's the minority, but there's so much involved with the whole topic of how can we know that, um, that the earth was either millions of years old or just a small number of thousands of years old? How can we, how can we know that? And, how can we be certain that the view we hold really has it kind of can't hold water, that it's a very plausible position. Mm -hmm. And certainly the old earth people, I understand their perspective. Um, I love those people. Um, many of them as fellow believers, as fellow Christians, yeah. 
are, are dear to me and, and I don't look down on them. I don't look at myself as aloof over them. Um, if they look at themselves as aloof over me individually, you know, that that's their prerogative and I, I won't resist, but, um, but you know, I've come to the place where I can get along with people who have different views than I do on lots of different things. You know, it's kind of like with age, you, with fine wine, right? Not, not that I drink wine, but I know the way it works with wine is as it ages, it gets even better and hopefully and, and more mature. And, and I hope that that's the case with us, that as we get older, we, we become more mature. We can get along with other people better. We can be patient and we can ag agree to disagree and we can talk about issues, sometimes even passionately, but at the end of the day, disagreeing and being comfortable with disagreeing. So, yeah. um, you know, that's kind of a little bit of my perspective. Um, yes, for me, it's literal. It, it's a literal account. And a, a, as one who studies ancient writings, you know, philology and, and, um, and does textual studies in, well, if we're talking about ancient languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, Middle and Late Egyptian, um, I see, and I've, I've, done, I've done work too in Assyriology, um, for example, my PhD dissertation, I ended up having to kind of delve into Assyriology that um, was a challenge for me because it's not my area of greatest focus, mm -hmm. but I loved doing it. I loved learning. I, I always love being stretched in areas of my weakness, right? And that's, I think that's really important for, for us as researchers to stretch ourselves, to push ourselves, to get ourselves out there in areas where we know yep. less than our specializations. But um, so um, what was I saying? You're talking about Assyriology, how- Assyriology, yes. Yeah, yeah. Who did you study? Did you learn Assyrian from? Who did you? I, I actually didn't learn Akkadian or the Assyrian oh, version of Akkadian, okay. um, but I ended up working a little bit with a couple of Akkadian texts. Okay. And so I had to depend on other people who were translating them. But sure. Doug Frain at the University of yes. Toronto yes. is the, the one that I worked with who helped me a lot in that area. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, so um, Assyriology um, is an important area of study. And, um, you know, it, so, so, so with Assyriological texts with, and, and especially Akkadian texts that go even back further than, than Assyrian. Um, we have a lot of ancient writings, old, Bab old Babylonian period, most of them dating to and so forth that are originated in the Akkadian period. Right. Um, and the stories behind them. And those texts um, present a lot of their uh, information in um, poetical form. But in contrast, the, the beginning of Genesis, in fact, well, you can even say pretty much almost all of Genesis, uh, especially if you don't count chiastic structure, but virtually all of Genesis is written in narrative form. And that's really important in all of this because you would not expect narrative text to be mythological, to be um, legendary, to be presenting um, religious perspective that's not rooted in actual events that take place. So in, if you read the text, it's really pretty clear um, in, in the book of Genesis that it's a blow-by-blow -blow account of a lot of different things that are going on. Right, right. And um, I know that with Genesis, I, there's, been a, there's been some debate about even how to translate the opening line of Genesis 1-1. So, so Genesis 1-1, as you know, Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim ve'et Haaretz. So Bereshit bara Elohim. There are those who would argue that it's a dependent clause and that that it should be translated when God created the heavens and the earth. And I, I just, you know, um, Doug. I mean, my study. I studied Hebrew under Professor Revel at the University of Toronto, who is now he's now I believe he was a Christian. He's he's with the Lord. Um, and and. I just don't see that. I, I, I see that Genesis 1-1 is telling us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that, mm -hmm. and that what we're presented with is the beginning, the origin of matter and time and space and energy and so forth. Um, because those who try to go through the, the dependent clause when God created, 
there's almost this jab at the idea of creatio ex nihilo, that, that really the Bible's not getting at this creation out of nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's problematic for me, uh, Doug, because the, the Septuagint agrees with, you know, the traditional reading, NRK, that in the beginning, same language in John 1, 1, that God mm -hmm. created and so forth. And, 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 and um, so maybe we can just talk a little bit about that. What yeah. are your thoughts on that, uh, Doug, Genesis yeah. 1? So um, th there are two, two, um, two parts to the answer that I want to hit with you. Sure. The first is more um, uh, summarizing, and the second would require, well, would, would be benefited by um, if I could show you a few things, just, sure. you know, show, show everybody a few things on the slideshow. That, yeah, I'll that, bring that up. Yeah. And I, um, I, let's say, let's just get right to the text. Uh-oh. Well, that's a challenge. Okay. Huh. Yeah, it doesn't like... Uh, oh, yeah, I have an yeah. ancient font that you may not have. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you have a PDF copy of it, it might show uh, a PDF of your uh, of your PowerPoint. Yeah. I, well, not handy, okay. but I, I guess I'll work with the, with the clutter here. But, um, I, and I'll come to this in a minute. The first part where the way I want to address your question is this. Um, and I go back to the late, no, to the early, early eighties, like 84, the first college course that I took, it was at a, at a junior college, which is a very popular thing in the U S obviously in Canada, it's not as big of a thing as it is in the U S and uh, it was my first course. It was a, um, general elective. And of course, with most U S institutions, you have to take one to two years worth of general ed courses before you can get into your major. So I took an ancient history course, which, of course, it's connected to my lifelong, well, since junior high, at least, my love for history. Mm -hmm. And I took a course at a junior college. And so it's a secular institution. And the professor, professor was very um, anti-biblical historicity. Okay. That, that kind of person. And his response in bringing up the biblical account in Genesis 1 and 2 is, hey, he said, um, in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2, we have two completely different accounts of creation. And that being the case, that's problematic. There should be just one account. And the fact that they're so different suggests to us that... I brought this up. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Doug, I just brought uh -huh. this up. I don't know if that would help. It's probably too small, uh, the text there. Yeah, it is kind of small, small, small for my eyes. So my apologies. Okay, well, that's we'll okay. come back to there. Okay. That's all right. Um, I, I kind of know the underlying Hebrew text there anyway. Yeah. And, and my translation is mostly visible, but, um, but so he said, yeah, because we have two different accounts and they're, and they're, uh, expressly different in what they're communicating. Mm. Obviously the writer of this biblical account didn't know what in the world he was doing. And, and they have to be contradictory because they are different and because they, they demonstrate or represent two different accounts. Right. Well, obviously at the time, you know, and I was still a Christian at, at, in already in 84. And so internally, you know, sitting in the class, the steam kind of came through my ears, but what can I say? I'm just a student in a class and I'm, you know, I was, oh, how old was I at the time? Uh, about 20, just about turning 20 at the time. And I don't have a platform, right? So I couldn't say much, but if I could go back and address that now, what I would say is this, you know, um, if you study what Moses, assuming you are, are open to the idea, you have one uniform author of the book of Genesis. And for me, it's Moses, but, you know, I understand that views differ on this. But if Moses ha is, if you look at how Moses writes the book of Genesis, a lot of it is couched in a, in a method where what he does is he presents some amount of, of, um, of chronological history. He goes from point A all the way to, you know, point S or whatever it is. And then he'll be done. And then he'll finish S and he'll, he'll then take a magnifying glass. And so this was, you know, this was a 40,000 foot kind of a flyover in an airplane. And he gets out a magnifying glass now and he, zooms in on one or two little parts from that overall timeline in what follows S. 
as he goes on in the next chapter or the next paragraph or whatever. And he does this consistently. And so what he'll do is in that big um, swath, um, the survey, he will, he will include all of the elements that are non-essential, right? Or, or non-stressed that, that, that he's going, that he's, that he's not going to want to stress subsequently. Right. So, you know, the lifetime of Ishmael, that kind of thing. It's not that big of a deal. So you can kind of go through it as you're in your survey and then move on to Isaac and really, you know, dig deep into Isaac's life and what goes on with Isaac. So that's, that's his normal modus operandi. Well, that being true, then if you understand that, look at uh, chapter one and look at chapter two. So one, one through two, four ends up being, um, a logical unit. In fact, it's probably better if we make the chapter break after two four rather than after one thirty one. But right. you know, it's too late for that. But um, that gives you a blow by blow account. And as, as I always tell my students when I when I teach Genesis, I say, listen, um, there's a fundamental difference between one one to two four and two five to the end of chapter two, and that is. Um, in, in that first portion where he's giving you the survey, it's a focus on the order of creation, right? It's the order of creation. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, rest on day seventh. That's all sequential and inherently chronological, right? So that's the pattern then that he establishes for much of the book. To give us that big picture, and it's it's mostly or all chronological. In this case, all chronological. Right. And then with two five, he jumps in and starts something different. Where he he takes you know he takes the big picture, he zooms in, he hones in on something, and what is it? Mankind. Why? Because mankind is the pinnacle of creation. So one one to two four is the order of creation. 2 5 to the end of chapter 2 is the pinnacle of creation. And that's a completely different emphasis. But what he's doing is he's taking something he already said in the first portion and he's building on it and going, going down really deep with it. Yeah. So that's why, that's how to explain why we have quote unquote two different accounts of translate of uh, of creation in Genesis. They're not, they're not to be understood as contradictory, they're, they're complementary. Right. But you have to understand what's going on, right, in, in how they're built. So that's that's the first thing I want to say to address it. Okay. Make sense? Perfect sense. Okay. Now, let's walk a little bit through um, that, that beginning of creation, um, that account in 1-1, which is so important. And so... Um, uh, it sets the stage for everything. And, and first of all, Tony, I want to address something in reference to what I said before, which is um, it, it's better to see 2-4 as the end of this first um, blow, first account of creation, the, the big picture. Right. And, and that's because we have this um, inclusio where um, it's kind of like a sandwich, right? When you make a sandwich, you have the top piece of bread and you have the bottom piece of bread. The meat is in the middle. So the most important part, that's the meat and right. whatever else, vegetables or something. But it's all enclosed in the, the top and bottom parts of the bread. And that's what we have with 1-1 one, one and 2-4. It's, it's a repetition of the statement. But here's something that bothers me to no end, that um, my fellow exegetes out there and my fellow philologists look at 1-1 one, one and say, aha, because we have that repetition in 2-4 that forms this inclusio, it's, it's the, the bottom half of the, or bottom part of the bread for the sandwich. Yeah. Um, that, that tells us that what we see in 1-1, it's just a bracket. It's not mm. to be understood literally as part of the text. Mm. Well, it, if there's anything you want to say, Tony, that it will blow my stack, that <laughs> may be in the top five. Right. right. And that's not the case at all. It's pure text. It's not like our Bibles where we have at the top of our Bible um, the book of Genesis or the book of Ephesians or um, the Revelation of John or whatever, right? 
those they're called superscriptions as yep. you know yep those superscriptions are not original text they're not they were introduced by people who who formulated um, a codex or, or a corpus of individual texts. Let's just say the the, um, the letters of Paul, right? So early on in the church, when individual letters were the only thing going on, somebody had the bright, bright idea, hey, maybe we ought to put all of the letters of Paul together into one corpus. So they did it. They compiled it. And once they compiled it and they wanted to flip through it and use it in church services and whatever, they had, you know, it was really difficult to figure out, okay, where do we go to get to you know, First Corinthians four. We don't even know where First Corinthians is so fast. How do we find it and stand up and quote it? So they decided, let's put superscriptions at the top to tell us what book it is, and then let's you know, eventually divide it into chapters and yeah. and uh, put the chapter numbers too, so that we can quickly get to a reference point. Right? That's the whole thing. But having said that, that same dynamic doesn't exist with the beginning of Genesis. It's text. It's pure, unadulterated text. Moses wrote it not as a heading to the book, but as as the beginning of the story. So that's important. All right. Next, um, to begin this, it's fascinating, Tony, to me, and and this really can't be stressed enough. I think, but the beginning of the text doesn't start with what's called the default Hebrew word order, which is VSO, verb, yep. Yep. subject direct object. Right. English is SVO, subject, verb, object. John hit the baseball, right? John hit the baseball. You know, you've got the Toronto Blue Jays, you get that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's very, it's very easy. And, and for us, that's our default word order. And it's, it's practiced almost religiously in English. There's very little variation from SVO. Right. There, there is on rare occasion, and you know, more, more often than not, you'll find that in translations of the Bible, like the King James and so forth. Um, um, what is it? Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Right, right. right. And narrow is the road that leads to life. Yeah, yeah. narrow is the road that leads to life. So we can we can take the um, predicate nominative and put it in the in the initial position for emphasis. It's called the emphatic position to put stress on it. Wide is the road, right? Or narrow is the road. So that the listener or, or reader can say, oh, that's what he's emphasizing. I get it. Yeah. Wow. That is a really narrow road. Mm -hmm. So that's what's going on at the beginning of Genesis. It's not it's not the typical VSO because there's a prepositional phrase that's, as, as we know, adverbial, put at the beginning, in the emphatic position, before mm -hmm. the verb. Why? Emphasis. So what the writer wants to communicate, and, and this kind of destroys this modern concept that's popular now called the multiverse. Yeah. Maybe there are multiple universes and they all kind of just bounced into being at once and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. No. In the beginning, and, and I understand that there's no article there in Hebrew, but because it's one of a kind in the universe, if, the, if, if there's something in the Hebrew Bible that's one of a kind in the universe, they don't need an article for definiteness. Right. Because everybody knows it's only one. So it's inherently... It's inherently um, definite. That's the case with this. So you can put the word the, like you see in my translation here, the in italics. I put it in italics because it's not there in Hebrew. Yeah. But it belongs because this is one of a kind in the universe because it's the one and only origin of the universe. Right. And as the one and only, there aren't others. That's be And that's why it's in the emphatic position. For whatever reason, Moses wants to jump up and down and say that this was in the one and only very beginning, right? So that's the beginning of it. Then, um, Bereshit bara. So then we come to our verb, bara, which is create, and it's in the uh, masculine, third, third person masculine singular. He created, it's a very simple cal verb in, in Hebrew, and it just means he created, um, and um, so, Bereshit bara Elohim. Then we have the word God. So now we return to, to our standard word order, which is VSO, verb, subject, object. So in English, we switch it. It says in Hebrew, um, created God, whatever he created. But we switch it to God created. And what's great about Elohim is it takes the, um, the, the, the Canaanite and Levantine deity, El, yeah. which is the king of the gods in the pantheon, the king of the gods. 
Yeah. And it uses that as the as the beginning point. So Moses uses that term. And and Tony, my research has demonstrated, and I'm gonna flip sure. to, to this right here. Um, with this inscription, this is Wadi Ohol 2. Here's the text as it as it um, reads in Proto-Continental Hebrew. So this dates to very um, early in time, 1834 BC, and it's in my book. It's one of the um, inscriptions that I translate. It's it's Proto-Continental Hebrew. It's written by the early Hebrews. Joseph is still alive at this time. J Jacob is dead. Ephraim and Manasseh are alive, um, and it's composed. Um, at Wadi Ohol, a site that is a military outpost. So, so Hebrew speaking and Hebrew writing people, and this is about, um, let's see, how many years? Uh, 34. So this is about 15 years after the invention of the alphabet. Mm. The Hebrew writer goes down to this site and writes and composes this inscription. And at the bottom of the inscription, Tony, right here, mm -hmm. th there we have an Aleph. That's an ox's head. Yeah. And yep. here we have a lamad, which is a um, shepherd's crook yep. that represents the um, concept of, it's of actually a verb. Lamad means, um, to, and to translate it as an infinitive, because that's the standard yep. lexical form in English, um, to learn or to study. Right? right. So here we have, and th this is a guttural letter, and this is a l sound, the right. l, like lady. Right. So here we have ale. So the, the vowel is, is non-existent. It's, it's implied, it's not written. So ale, right there, ale. And it's a Hebrew writing this, right? This is a, because that's the Hebrew text. That's not Middle Egyptian hieroglyphics. It's this early form, one of the earliest examples we have of this proto-consonantal text, script. So here we have a, 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 the use of ale, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the whole reading is surrounding the crooked one, your afflictor, implied predication is... Ale is God. So mm -hmm. that 1834 Hebrew writer writes El. Why? Because they already at that time were using El, El, as a, an acceptable word for the Hebrews to represent the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right. So that tells me they're embracing the Canaanite term, even though they don't necessarily connect it with the Canaanite God. They connect it with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they use the term. So going back to um, um, the text of, of Genesis 1 1. So Elohim, uh, and you can't see it here, but it would be right here. Elohim is El plus the plural ending. And Hebrew is the only Semitic language we know of that uses the plural ending to refer to one God. Right. That's mind blowing. Yeah. Why did Moses do this? It's easy. Because he is writing as a Trinitarian, one who believes in the existence of God in more than one person. Mm -hmm. right? we, we know that because at the, at the end of chapter one of Genesis, you have the Godhead, you know, the council of the Godhead declaring what we are going to do, right? We're going to make man in our image. And that's not a mistake. Right. It's plural purposefully. Why? Moses already believes. He, yes. By revelation, probably directly from God, direct communication. He yeah. believes that there's one God. And, and he does so as well, uh, Doug. He does so against the rules of Hebrew grammar. I mean, the art, you know, in Hebrew grammar, as you know, the, the verb uh, has to complement the noun. So if the noun is singular, usually the verb that accompanies it is singular. But in this case, in Genesis 1 1, the, the, the verb bara is the third masculine singular. Whereas Elohim is a third masculine plural noun, yeah, and, and so it's so so it, it's just interesting that it, it jumps out at the reader because it, it, according to the rules of grammar that the, the noun and and the verb and the adjective and the pronouns are supposed to uh, agree with one another in gender and number and so forth. But yes. here we have the opening line of, of the Word of God, and and right there you have Elohim, a third person masculine plural. Noun being used with the singular bara. Tony, I am such a grammar freak. As you were talking, the, literally, the, the hair on my legs stood up <laughs> because it's so exciting to me. And you're exactly right. You've hit it on the head. There is non agreement grammatically, but there's perfect agreement theologically. 
right? And so it's not saying in the beginning gods right. created, but God, one God. And we're using a term that's in the plural that's to be understood in the singular because it's one God, but it's in the plural because this is a God who exists in more than one person, right? right. It, it's, that, it's that one probably biggest theological truth that you simply cannot wrap your mind around. The only mm -hmm. thing you're left to do is wrap your heart around it. Yeah. How can God exist as one, but in three persons? Right. I don't know, but he does it. He pulls it off. But the bottom line is I can't judge God by what I know in my world that he created. Instead, I have to let God judge me by what he knows in his world. Right. And I have to accept the revelation he gives of himself as crazy as it may sound at times. I accept it. And here's the thing. The longer you embrace by faith that that is true, the more it makes sense to you in your heart, number one, and the more you can come to terms with it and accept it. And it becomes something that is absolutely beautiful and, and gorgeous to embrace. True? Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so we have, in the beginning, jumping out at us, um, the, the God, okay, the king of the gods who exists in plurality created, right? In the beginning, the God who exists in, um, the king of the gods who, who exists in, in plurality created, and now we get to the beginning of the object, the direct object, and it's a twofold direct object. Yeah. And I think, Tony that we have, um, we have missed the mark with translating ideally. And I'm talking about the, um, the conjunction here, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But let's start with the first thing he creates, okay? If, if I'm an artist, and I'm not, Tony, but if I'm an artist, what I do, excuse me, and I'm old school, right? I don't do it on right. the computer screen. I have this big easel. I put up a canvas, and I have my palette, all the colors, and I have my paintbrush. What's the first thing I'm going to paint? on in a typical painting on the canvas answer the background that's what i'm going to paint first so i paint the background let's say um it's a it's a, a scene in a in a meadow right so i paint the background i it's grass everywhere almost all grass maybe some sky blue at the top or something but it's almost everywhere i fill it in with grass right so it's green and you know la la, la. and then i'm going to put i don't know um uh, if i'm in australia i suppose a kangaroo as the main object. And so, bam. I, and, and so after you're done with the background, that's the second thing as an artist you, you, you draw or you paint is the main object, the biggest, most important thing that's supposed to go in that painting. And that's the kangaroo. And usually right. you put it in the middle, right? And that's how painting works. Well, think of God in terms of a divine painter. What does he do? He's going to create something. So what does the painter do? He, he creates the background first. What's his background? It's not like me as a simple painter, right? Where I have a palette with black, you know, let's say I'm going to do outer space with, with black paint and I just paint a whole um, yep. canvas full of black paint. And that's my background. That's two dimensional and it's kind of simple and it's, you know, it's okay, yeah. but God can do better, way better. What he does, he creates not two dimensional black but he creates three-dimensional black, and not just three-dimensional, right? But infinite three-dimensional black. Why? Because the infiniteness reflects his character. What is one of the, the incommunicable qualities of his character, meaning a, an attribute of God that he can't pass on to us? Mm -hmm. One of those is, as you know, is infiniteness. I'm not infinite. I'm stuck here in Richmond, Texas, right? I can't, I can't be in Toronto, Canada, uh, Ontario, Canada, where you are. I mean, if I get on a plane, it's going to take, you know, 12 yeah. hours to get there or whatever. But um, God makes an infinite three-dimensional background, and he's going to paint his painting in that three-dimensional limitless background. So that's the first thing that he creates. And, um, and, and the Hebrew word is shemayim, as you know, and that's, that's in the dual. Ayim, im is plural, which is three and above. 
Yep. But ayim is dual, meaning paired. Right. So let's say in English we were going to use that concept. In English we just have singular and plural, but let's say we're going to invent something. So let's say at the end of a word that's that's a pair, we say ish. So yep. I have um, earish. I have nostrilish. <laughs> I have um, lit, you know, lipish, right? Yeah. And that's what Hebrew does. Yeah. So Shemaim is in pair. Um, what is the Shemaim? Well, uh, the the perspective of the writer of the biblical text is not. It, it, it's, the Bible was not written scientifically. It's not a scientific textbook. It doesn't. I believe it doesn't contradict science, but it's not right. a science textbook. Right. So how is it written? It's written perspectively, not scientifically. What does that mean? It's written from the perspective of a human being. If this is Earth, right? My hand is Earth. Yep. It's kind of rounded. A human being standing on planet Earth, looking down, you know, into the ground or outward or upward. And when that human being looks upward, that's the Shemaim. What's in the Shemaim? Well, um, there are three main translations for it. The abode of God, where God dwells, that's the term is used for that. Second, Shemaim is used for the... Um, the deep, dark, black, infinite outer space. Right. Shemaim is used for that. Third, the main third um, translation option is the light blue that's in the sky that we call sky blue. So the atmosphere during the day is the Shemaim. But then you go 12 hours later and you're looking up at the night sky and you know, assuming you're not in Toronto or Houston, right? You can see stars. Um, and so... But the main thing you're seeing is the background. You're seeing the deep, dark, black, infinite outer space. So what did he create the first day? Well, it's not the abode of God because he already exists in the abode of God before creation. So scratch that out. The atmosphere hasn't been created yet, right? There's no separation between the waters below and the waters above. So it can't be the blue sky of, of the atmosphere. By process of elimination, what is it? It's the deep, dark, infinite outer space. So we could easily and legitimately translate this the cosmos or the the universe. Right. So, so here's what we got so far. In the one of a kind in the universe beginning, the God who exists in plurality, no, the king of the gods, sorry, who exists in plurality, created the deep, dark, infinite outer space. Okay, that's a... That's an interpret what we would call an interpretive translation. Mm -hmm. Then we come to the second thing that he creates. So what he creates first isn't an object per se, but it's a background. So the next thing he creates, second in order, is the first object. And the and this this goes against the rules of standard um, astronomy and astrophysics, right? Uh, th the first object that God creates is the Earth. So I will gladfully, we you know, gleefully disagree with every scholar out there who says no, the Earth isn't the first object in the universe that's created. It is. It is. Why? Because Revelation tells me that, and I believe the Spirit of God, who worked in harmony with Moses, more than I believe the people out there with scientific degrees who tell me that it's not the first thing created in the universe. So um, so that's what he creates first. And then, um, yeah, the, the, the outer space. Second then is the earth. But look at the, the, at the relationship of, with what comes between these, Tony. It's the Hebrew um, conjunction, wow, which is by those who fall under the Germanization of yeah. Hebrew, they call it a vav, but really it, technically it's a, it's a wow. Um, so that conjunction, it's unlike anything we've got in English, right? It's a chameleon conjunction because it can be translated as any coordinating conjunction and or but mm -hmm. or any subordinating conjunction, conjunction after, since, while, when, et cetera, et cetera, right. et cetera. Right, right. That being the case, let's go back to what we talked about before, Tony. Mm -hmm. Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4. Is an emphasis on what part of creation? The, the um, order of creation. 
It is? Yes. It's all strictly chronological. That means he created the Shemayim, that which is above from the perspective of, of a person standing on earth, the deep, dark, black, infinite outer space. He created that first, and then chronologically, he second created the earth. So a better translation for that wow conjunction, Tony, I-M-H-O, in my humble opinion, yeah. is then. So here we go. Let's put it all together. In the one-of-a-kind beginning, um, the king of the gods who exists in plurality created the deep, dark, infinite universe. Pause. Then the earth. Mm. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And that's Genesis 1-1. Understood as, I think, an ancient Hebrew would have understood it in, in many ways. So that kind of gives us, I think, a much richer understanding of what's going on in this first verse in the Bible and the context in which it fits in right. Genesis 1 and 2. How's that for a short answer? That's No, that's, that's, that's amazing. I mean, I've never really heard it put that way, but I could see the, gramma, the grammar would definitely, uh, uh, would definitely support that interpretation as well and translation. Yeah, I gave I gave it my best for you. Yeah. Yeah. And food for thought for everyone who can hear this. Yeah. So then moving on to verse two, um, um, what's the connection then with verse two? The verse two is the beginning of the the ordering of the the planet Earth. Yeah. So at this point, he pauses, I think, from his his creating from from uh, listing those objects of his creation and he's focusing now to on on what he's on the way in which he has made planet earth which is the the second element of his creation the first object of his crea creation so he's just going into greater detail now so this is almost um as far as the the blow by blow of the narrative it's the um, it's a parenthetical thought in a sense, right. right? So he's describing what the what the earth looked like. And he's contrasting it, of course, with the way that his readers know it to be in their day. So as it was first made, it was, and here I believe a better translation is, um, it's, not, it's not chaotic and void or something to that effect. It's unformed and unfilled. It had not yet reached its final stage. It was in a, you know, embryonic state. It was in a in, an initial phase. And so that's describing that the earth is not yet like we know it to be in, in the time that we're writing this text. Right. 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 And then um, he describes it further that darkness was over the surface of the primordial deep. So, Tony, th this kind of... Um, coincides with what I tried to argue earlier in this perspectival writing um, statement. Namely that, remember, we're, we're looking at everything from the perspective of a person standing on planet Earth. At this point, you can't stand on planet Earth because it's water, right? Unless you're Jesus standing on water, yeah. you know, you can't stand, but it's, that's, that's the idea. So we're, you know, the author's already focusing it, uh, focusing us in on what's on top of the surface of the water as if we could stand there and see it or on top of the earth. Right. And it's water. It's filled with, with this great depth of water. And as this is happening, um, it's all taking place in darkness, right? Which is, which is really great because he's going to introduce the spirit of God to this and how he's observing this. The spirit of God is going to be observing this. And of course, if it's you or I, Tony, you know, um, it's, you know, it's impossible. We don't know what we're observing if it's all in darkness on the surface mm -hmm. of the earth. So this gives you a window into the ability of the spirit of God when there's no land yet on earth, who's he's able to be above the land and, and hover over it like a hovercraft or whatever yep. uh, over the water. And um, he's in the darkness, he's able to see and discern and understand what's going on. And this is like God. And, and, and we see this in the rest of the creation narrative, that God bounces off the walls 
when he gets the opportunity to create something. And usually he creates it and he observes it and he loves it and he's impressed by it. And so he's urged on to create something next or something new. You know, he, he creates a, a plant, a tree in full form, right? Not a seedling, in full form. It's beautiful. It's got limbs and branches and leaves all over and it's alive. And he's so excited. And what does he do? I'm going to make another tree. So he makes another tree. Sees that. Wow, that's cool. It's different than the other one. It's got limbs to go this way and yeah. go under. And let's do another one. He does the third one. So this is the spirit of God getting excited in the darkness, watching the, the flow of the water on top of the earth as he's hovering over top of it. And, mm. and let me add a, a quick note, to Tony. Um, we're going to be introduced to the light next. But before we get to the light, remember, the light is only significant in reference to its relationship to what's going on on the surface of planet Earth, right? Because it's perspectival. That's right. But actually, there's already, there, there's got to have been a light already created. Before that light, what's that first light that I'm referring to? It's not in the text. But right. think about it. What's at the core of our planet? Mm -hmm. Molten yep. lava, right? Yep. Right. And because of the energy and the heat that's involved, it's going to have luminescence. You know, I, I don't know the, the number, how that works, how, how bright it is, but it has light to it. Right. Wow. So God creates a light that he doesn't even, you know, he could put himself on the map for the origin of the light at the center of the earth, but he doesn't. Why? That's not the focus. The center of the earth is not the focus. It's on the outside of the earth where mankind is going to be because mankind chapter two is the pinnacle of creation. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of exciting that God purposefully hides. He, he, in humility, he doesn't take credit for the first light that was created. He, he only takes credit for the first light that's going to shine on the outside of planet earth. Mm, interesting. And at the same time, uh, um, Doug, we also notice that unlike the uh, Enuma Elish, uh, the, the the Babylonian epic of creation, there is no theogony. You know, there's no battle between God and as you find the, in the Enuma Elish with Marduk and the gods fighting Tiamat and, and so forth. There's none of this in Genesis. God is not in conflict with other beings. Uh, God is totally sovereign over the created order and bringing things about and, and separating. There's that separation and bringing together, uh, you know, the water's coming into one place and land appears and uh, separates the light from the darkness, calls the light day, calls the darkness night. Uh, so it's quite interesting that a lot of folks who try to say that the the author of Genesis, uh, the, the, the creation account was simply copied from uh, the, the Enuma Elish or, you know, the flood story was, came from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, what we're finding is that the, the Bible is a is a very su su generous. It's a very unique text in itself, and it's so very dissimilar from what we find in these other uh, 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 Canaanite, Babylonian, Assyrian texts. Yeah, excellent point, and that's that's so true. There's no competitor here, right? I mean, look at any good movie, any good book. Um, what do you have? You have a, a protagonist and an antagonist. Yeah. There's no antagonist here. Yeah. It's God alone. You're, you're so right. And, and, and that is almost, uh, it's breaking precedent for the mind of the average thinker because there's always conflict, right? right? And, and that's why we see it in Enuma Elish because they're in the midst of a, a world where, where there are kings of, of, um, of uh, city-states who are competing for for authority and 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 trying to take one take over one another's kingdoms and so forth so it makes sense that the the story they would they would um create of create their story of creation they would create would involve such a conflict and would, would revolve involve terror and and evil right there's evil in that story from the beginning right but in our story, in, in the Bible story, there's no evil. There's no antagonist and no evil. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what else do you have uh, for us in the slides, uh, Doug? So well, 
Um, let's see. Let's talk about the light. Um, I'm going to go to this. I, I, look here. So we can see a little bit of this. Um, so then God said, let there be light. And there was light. This is one three. Right. Let there be light. And there was light. And so my question is, what was the source of this light of the creation in day one? So lots of options. Could it be our sun, soul? Um, you can't be dogmatic and say um, in every indication, you know, there's no possibility whatsoever, but you'd have to suggest it's created twice because it doesn't show up again until day four where right. it's created. So um, a day one creation of soul and then a day four creation of soul, that's pretty contradictory in my mind. So that can't be this. Um, could it be a later destroyed star where God said, okay, you know, until we get to day four, I need something to, to kind of, you know, get the job done to keep the place from freezing up and whatever. I've got to put a light there. Uh, let's put a temporary light and then let's destroy it. And some people have suggested this. Well, not, not impossible, but very implausible because that doesn't seem to mesh with the character of God. Right. Why would he in a perfect world, perfect universe, create something that he's going to end up destroying because it's only temporary. Just make the final product. Um, so it, I don't think that's a plausible option either. Some people have said, well, maybe this is God. Maybe the light of um, day one of creation is God himself. Again, I don't know that I can be 1,000%, if you will, to be use hyperbole, uh, dogmatic and say yeah. it can't be. But it doesn't make any sense to me, and it's illogical, and I think it's actually contradictory because go to the end of our book as we have it today, not Genesis, but the Bible in whole, in Revelation 22, what's true? In that world on the new earth that will be, that we who are with God forever, we will be in physical bodies on the new earth living. We're not going to be floating on right. you know, in, in, in infinity somewhere. Um, on that earth... Um, there will be no, there will be no need for an external light source like our sun soul. Why? The text is very clear. God Himself will be the light. Right. Right. That being the case, um, it's very clear though that there is no darkness there. Well, there is in our world. If you don't believe me, wait twelve hours from where you are now. Right. Darkness will come. That light doesn't encompass everything, but the light of the of the new earth, it's all encompassing so that there's no darkness allowed on the earth. None. Zero. Zip. If that's the case, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Because if it's God who is the light, there can't be darkness anywhere. But that's not what we've got with this light that's created. And we'll we'll see that in a minute. So now I want to try to answer my own question. I guess, I guess it's not fair to pose the question and not answer it, right? Mm. Oh, and another uh, answer that, that I, I actually heard from one of my students within this last school year that kind of was a head-scratcher to me. Uh, I had a student who said, um, angels. <laughs> well, I think Job 38.7 destroys that view, but um, I won't go into that either. So what could it be? Well, let's look, Tony. Um, and, and I'm just theorizing at this point. This is, let's let's call this um, a hypothesis, right? It's a working hypothesis. It's mm -hmm. not a, you know, I, I'm um, I'm going to go to the wall for this one kind of a thing. But I think that what seems most logical to me is that there was something like one or more, one or more. Um, let's just say, and for lack of better terms, because I don't have a good term for this, Tony. A blob. Okay. okay. This is a blob of material. It's all of the, and so whether it's in one place or whether it's in several places, I don't know, but it's you know the one or multiple blobs are they 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 together com comprise or compose all of the heat, light, energy, matter, etc., gases in the entire universe, right? Mm -hmm. And they exist in this blob. And let's say that, again, whether there's one or more, 
the one blob that's closest to our planet Earth that's already created, right? It's already there. The, the closest one that's there, um, it is able to shine light on planet Earth in such a way that it, according to the text that we haven't looked at yet, but it's you know one four, that it separates um, light from the darkness on planet Earth, and then it goes on to say, and it was morning, and it was um, it was evening, it was morning, the first day, right? Right. Or, I'm sorry, that's not right. It's not day one. Day one. Day one. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll come to that in a minute. Um, so that being the case. In that statement of verse four, which again, I'm not showing you, there is this move, this revolving of the earth one complete time on its axis in such a way that if you're a person standing at any point on planet earth, you're watching the whole movie in a 24 hour literal day. Right. Because um, the earth has revolved once on its axis and that person standing at that one point on planet earth is able to see the progression from daytime to evening time to nighttime to morning time when the sun comes back up and they've revolved once around the earth completely. So that light source automatically has to be shining on 50% of the planet and the other 50% is in darkness. So it's giving us a map for a day, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So that being true, is it possible that, for example, our galaxy existed in such a form that it was just one big fat blob that it was at some safe distance from planet Earth that it wasn't going to, you know, vaporize the planet, blow it up, but it's far, far enough away that it's a safe distance, but it's close enough that what God could do is, call, well, that, that the light source would be strong enough, number one, and number two, that God would would create the light in such a way that it was shining on planet Earth within a 24-hour literal day. Mm -hmm. Now, how could that be the case? Easy. It, it's it's clear-cut for anybody who accepts the young Earth view. Uh, that tree that was created, was that created as a seed or a tree? A tree. Tree. Um, the lamb that was created, is that... Is that a, an embryo or a lamb? That's a lamb. Lamb. Uh, Adam was created as an embryo or a man? A full man. A full-grown man. So God didn't cheat. You know, there's no cheat code here. God didn't um, deceive. He didn't deceive you by suggesting to you that, um, you know, Adam's got these untracked years somewhere of his life because he had to grow up from, from a egg and a sperm to full fledged right. man, full fledged man. No, he created him in, you know, with, with the appearance of age, not to deceive, but for the, so not some, with something negative in mind, but with something positive in, in mind mm -hmm. to give something good, a complete man who can eat, who can um, name the animals, who can care for his woman and, you know, on and on of what right. he can do uh, in the garden of Eden on earth. So, but if God creates an embryo, it's not going to work out so well, right? So he creates with full-blown form at the beginning in, in creation. Right. If he did that with all of the green plant life and everything existing on earth, on the land, he did that with all the animals on the land and in the sea and in the sky. Sure. He, he can, and with mankind, he can do the same thing with light. Yeah. He can have a light source millions or billions of light years away by distance, but created in such a way that its emanation of light is coming at us and hitting planet Earth as if it started millions of years ago. But without that age, is God attempting to deceive us if this is true? No. It's we who are superimposing our conception of how creation had to exist. We're we're superimposing that on God and, and on the biblical narrative. Right. And I don't think we need to do that. So all that to say, Tony, if we come to day four, when it's time for the sun created, and this is great. He creates the sun, which is the greater or lesser light. Yeah. 
greater light, the yep. the and or the or gadol. Yep, and he creates the moon, which is the wet light. The or katan. Yep, the, it's the, the smaller lesser light, light. The lesser light. And then, as if Tony, and this is the really hilarious part. You've got to love this. The the, the hair's already standing on my leg. <laughs> uh, as a parenthetical thought, as a footnote of insignificance, almost. He says, oh, yeah, and by the way, he created the stars. Yeah. That is the coolest part. You've yeah. got an infinite universe that's all of a sudden um, filling up, starting on day four, with stars. How did he do that? Well, if he if he had a blob here, Tony, right, like at the center yeah. of our galaxy, is yeah. te technically it's a supermassive black hole called Sag Sagittarius A star at the center of our galaxy. But... Around it, I mean, there's there's matter, there's light, there's heat, there's I mean, it's a brew of there's uh, gases. It's a it's a witch's brew of, you know, imposing elements, if you will. Right, right. But if it's all just a blob in the beginning, and then he spins it into existence and sends it off into motion, right? Then and all of it traveling together, and as our scientists have told us, the beginning of the first um the first the first matter that goes off from nothingness it had to be faster than the speed of light right that's that's mathematically right. proven already faster right. than the speed of light so if if god can whip this blob into into some kind of orderly element where you have a supermassive black hole at the beginning at the center and you have this 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 conglomerate of elements that create light in the middle and then you have these spirals as it's spinning and turning right because it's moving yeah. throughout yeah. space um all of this can happen on day four and at the same time one of the one of the stars that he pops out of this um this blob of light heat matter energy etc is our star soul and he puts it in perfect position in relation to the earth and at the same time, probably, he creates the planets, right? So that, I think, Tony, is a scenario that fits all of the exegetical data, and it compromises none of the certain astronomical data that um, has already been proven um, to be there. Right, right. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So so having just talked about the, the creation of the universe— uh, maybe we can talk a little bit, um, Doug, about uh, Adam, Adam and Eve as the first human pair. Because as you know, um, uh, William Lane Craig wrote a book on 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 Adam, and he will tell you right up front, we, I believe in historical Adam. But what he means by that is that Adam, as we know him in the Bible, uh, was a hominoid who came later and, and that God uh, breathed uh, a living soul into him. So that at that point, uh, the hominoid becomes the image of God, the Imago Dei. So maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the, the 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 Genesis account of the first human pair um, and why this understanding of Adam and his wife Eve um, as literal human beings, as the first, not just as uh, descendants of some of some common ancestor, but as the first human beings made in the image of God. Um, a couple of things I noticed in the Genesis account as well, uh, Doug, is that Genesis tells us that there was no man to till the earth. Uh, and, and the Hebrew word, the Hebrew negative particle lo is very emphatic, as you know, it's used in the Ten Commandments. Uh, yeah. There was no man to till the earth. Um, and so when I look at language like that in Genesis, it seems to indicate that when it says there was no man, there was no man. There was this 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 person called Adam was the first of his kind uh, in terms of the first human, uh, the first human being made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you, did you want me to re remove that PowerPoint for now? Um, oh, yeah, you can. Sure. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So maybe we can just talk a little bit about Adam, the historical Adam and, and Eve mm -hmm. and and why uh, the, the language of Genesis clearly uh, is pointing here to um a, a first human being, not some hominoid that evolved into uh, into Homo sapien. Sure, and 
I'll start by saying that um, as a qualification, William Lane Craig is one of the, if not the top Christian philosopher that uh, we have on the planet today. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I came really close to being at a conference where I was going to speak that he was going to be the keynote speaker. And I was really looking forward, forward to uh, meeting him, but it was scheduled to be, I think in the month of April of 2020, which mm-hmm. means it was COVID yeah. uh, canceled, but, um, and his contributions are enormous and are potent and are useful and are strong. And as they relate to, um, lots of different, um, issues related to philosophy and Christian worldview, um, I don't want to th- you to think or anyone to think that we should quickly dismiss anything that William Lane Craig says. Um, we should read everything carefully and critically, and we sh- I think we should go in there knowing that a lot of the argumentation he gives for, um, you know, um, different issues related to all, all the other philosophical, philosophical topics Mm -hmm. that they're, they're going to be some of the best argumentation we can find Mm -hmm. to make points and prove points. So that's a qualification, Yeah. but yeah, I'm hundred percent on board with you. Adam is a historical figure. um, And I think you've, you've pointed to one of the important clues um, in that. Yes. At the time of his creation, there's, you know, there's no man to till the earth, um, that he is um, created immediately in the image of God. And I think um, that the majority of the people who are going to embrace the kind of view that William Lane Craig is suggesting are much more sympathetic, if not already committed to an old earth view. It's Mm -hmm. going to fit an old earth view better and give you more um, potential credibility in, in the minds of its adher- adherents with, um, with that position. And, and so I understand the reasoning behind it, um, but you know, I, I, I would firmly disagree. And, and I would say that Adam is created in full form, physically and spiritually, yeah. so that his, his spirit is localized within his person, within his physical three-dimensional body on planet Earth from day six of creation and, um, and remains the case. And, and that he doesn't, there, there's no indication in the text anywhere that he gains important elements of humanity that, that we have with subsequent generations that need to c- come later, right? I think Moses wouldn't have fooled around with us or with his readers. Yeah. He wouldn't have given those kinds of um, important additions if it's something that happened later. So his his creation in the image and likeness of God had to be, again, chronological. Right? Yeah. The order of creation fit in a, on a chronological timeline. On day six, he had to be created with full physical form, with full spiritual form, and in the image of God, so that he, his existence in the image and likeness of God was complete already on day six with nothing that needed to be added. You know, you, you got to add all the elements before you put the cake in the in the oven, right? Right. You can't bake the cake and then add your eggs or your flour or your you know, yeast or whatever you add. Um, and, and everything in mankind was already there. It's just we need to exercise that faith to say, even if I don't understand how the creation listed in Genesis 1 and 2 um, overcomes all of the arguments of the professional, secular, uh, academic um, society that is pushing us and persuading us that we are non-academic and we are non-intelligent or less intelligent if we accept anything outside of the paradigm they're creating. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it goes back to the Hebrew statement, Tony, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right. Hebrews 11. Yeah. At the end of the day, there's got to be elements to important things and in, in, in what goes on in, in the world that's out there 
that require of us the element of faith, of having faith and trust in God that what he said matches with what happened and with mm-hmm. what is and with what will be. And that requires something from within, from the spirit. And without that, Tony, I think we'd be less than what we are. Yeah. I think it's a it's a tremendous asset that we have that God allows us to have that which he demands that comes from faith. Mm. By faith, I believe the earth was created before the distant most reddish looking star or star system in the um, in the horizon, which is what, 13.2 or 13 point something million billion light years away. Right. right. 13.6 or whatever the number. Somehow, some way, the earth is older. I can't necessarily prove it empirically with a chemistry kit, but yeah. I know it's true, Tony. I know it's true. I have zero doubt whatsoever because I know the God who informed us through the writing of Moses that it happened that very way. And I think God wants me to believe that even if I can't prove it with a chemistry kit. Right. And that gives him greater glory. And it, and it gives me more ultimate eventual approval from God when he looks at me and says, thank you, Doug Petrovich, for believing that this was true, even though you read book after book and article after article where trained scholars told you it was, it was wrong. You believed it anyway. And for that, I commend you. Right? Mm-hmm. Where's that? Where's the excitement over that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and also, uh, as you know, Doug, the, the the institution of marriage goes right back to the beginning. It's the, It was, it was the, one of the first ordinances God created prior to the fall. It was a mm-hmm. pre-fall ordinance. <clears throat> and the very fact that we humans, we clothe ourselves. I mean... Why do human beings clothe themselves? I don't. Mm-hmm. No other animal does that. I mean, God created birds with feathers, and He created animals with their their hide and and fur and so forth and so on. And fish have scales, uh, and and of course crabs and and and, and crustaceans have shell uh, exterior skeletons. But but we're the only creatures that that clothe ourselves. And evolution doesn't have an answer to that right. because they believe we're all. Uh, you know, we're all nude colonies at the beginning, just nomadic uh, nude colonies traveling about. But but the fact that human beings dress themselves, that they cover themselves, the only logical answer is that we lost something. We lost the glory. They lost something in the garden. When Adam and Eve rebelled mm-hmm. against God, then they realized they were naked. Then shame set in. Then they hid and they, they sewed up fig leaves to cover their nakedness. But prior to that, that there is no sense of shame. Uh, yeah. And, and it, it would seem to me that evolution certainly doesn't give us an answer to that question. Um, but scripture most certainly does, as we're the only creatures who do this. It's a phenomena only known to humans. You're right, Tony. And isn't this another argument in favor of the immediate introduction mm. of the image and likeness of God inherent within mankind? Because that is the... It, that, that is the mechanism within us that makes us put on clothes, that makes the animals ignorant of all of this, because morality is part of our essence as those created in the image of God. The, the animals lack a sense and a, a reality of morality. We have that. And we know because of the, the act of original sin and, 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 and the difference between right and wrong is open to our eyes. That works on this morality mechanism in us. Yeah. And that creates the shame element that says we've got to put on clothes or we look less than who we should be. And right. we should go hide from people, right? right. So you're right. That, that's, that's an extremely potent um piece of argument of the overall yeah. argumentation for the immediate imposition of the image and likeness of God in mankind right from the beginning, because without that, um, there's no reason to cover ourselves then. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. I've, I've shared this with my students as well, uh, Doug, that it's interesting that in marriage, uh, that, that shame is taken away. I mean, a husband and wife in the covenant of marriage, 
that love each other and so forth. And, you know, the two, the two shall become one flesh and this brings about new life and so forth. That sense of shame is removed. It's almost as if we are, we're getting a, 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 almost a taste of Eden, a, a momentary, although finite, mm -hmm. uh, uh, recapitulation of, of Eden. Sure. Which, which is temporarily, if you will, restored within the, the covenant of marriage. And that's why outside of marriage, God frowns on, on any sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage. But within that covenant, there is no sense of shame mm -hmm. because it is something holy. It's something beautiful. It is something that God has brought, you know, what God has joined together. Jesus said, let no man separate. So it's interesting that that we start looking at all these little dots and they all seem to coalesce and they all seem to find their source, of course, in Eden. But the beautiful thing about, uh, of course, Eden is that man tried to cover his nakedness, but it was God himself who, who took the hides of two animals. So that would have been, I mean, when you think about it, they would have witnessed the death of this animal where God took its hide and covered them. He clothed them. And so we have this beautiful picture of God clothing us, shadow types of, Christ. He, we've been clothed in Christ and we are clothed in his righteousness. Uh, and so it's such a, a, again, a profound picture. It's not just literal, but there's also a deeper spiritual meaning to yeah. what God has done. Yeah, you're right. Very good point, Tony. And, and to kind of add on to what you said, um, you're right about that, about that shame removal with the intimacy of marriage. And, and look at the, the example with, with, uh, with Noah, um, soon after the flood when when he was you know drunk with wine for a son or a grandson to look on a parent or a grandparent even if it's male to male there's the element of shamefulness to it and so i mean you'd think wow that's about as you know apart from marriage that's about as intimate as you can get a father yeah. and a son or a grandson or something and yet that protection doesn't exist in that close relationship but only in the marital bond, right? So, yeah, that that kind of um, yeah. supports your argument too, and enhances yeah. it. Yeah, and maybe we can just talk. Maybe we'll talk. This will be our last uh, topic, and then, uh, folks, if you have any questions uh, for Dr. Petrovich, please put a Q in the chat, a capital Q. Put your question in there, and we'll try to get to your questions uh, very soon now. So please uh, start placing your questions on the chat. So maybe we can we can end uh, our discussion, uh, uh, Doug, by talking about. Uh, Noah and, and talking about the the, the 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 flood story. As you know, uh, people like Michael Heiser and uh, many others uh, would argue that the flood of Genesis six to nine was a local flood. Um, and I, I always laugh when I say this because it's it's it's. I mean, I, I guess in the course of our discussion, I'll, I'll explain why I, I do find it very funny, but they will deny that there was an actual universal global flood, uh, that it's really a local flood and that, um, and that uh, Noah really didn't have to, um, this wasn't really a case of the whole planet Earth being submerged in, in water again, as we see it in Genesis 1-2. Um, so maybe you can just talk towards that uh, because the, the Noah story and the flood story in particular is another one that seems to be assailed uh, these days, even by fellow Christians. Sure. Great point. And yeah, there are fellow Christians that I know and love who subscribe to a local flood view. Um, I'll continue to love them and care for them and respect them as brothers and sisters. Um, but I'll definitely disagree with them on this issue. Uh, it makes no sense at all. The devastation on the earth with a local flood, um, where do all, how do all the other people die out in a, you know, a few feet of water, um, <laughs> and the animals, it makes no sense. Um, <clears throat> so clearly the narrative seems to suggest, because it's talking about the, the height of the water over the, the tallest mountain. And most Christian geologists suggest to us that a lot of our peaks today, that are post-flood mountain peaks are far higher than they were before the flood. So mountains were minuscule in contrast before the flood. And for all I know, they're probably right. But still, however high the mountain was, the highest mountain was, and at that time, Tony, we have Pangaea. We have mm -hmm. one land mass. Right. That's, um, 
that's a given. You can pop up the slideshow for, for a second if you want. And sure. Jump onto that slide. Um, let's see. There it is. There's Pangea. So if you were to take um, the majority of the continents and land masses of today and put them back as if they were a jigsaw puzzle, you'd see that South America fits right in here with this um, this wedge out of Africa. Yep. And that Africa fits together almost perfectly with, well, um, this here, which goes south of Sinai. Uh, with India here fits in this to wedge in here. And then An Antarctica fits in here. And of course, in ancient most times, Antarctica had plant life all over it, right? Like yes. you see here. Yes. How do you get plant life on An Antarctica? It has to be a completely different world. Yes. And uh, and how does that fit with a with a with a local flood? Um, and so Antarctica is here, and Australia fits against um, this portion of Antarctica. And what you have is you have certain <clears throat> plants and animals that are um, native to parts of, let's say, this part of Australia, and then the, they they're not up here in Australia, and they're not in the west of Australia. But they are in our Antarctica in ancient times. This this plant in this case, yeah, um, it's all through this part of Antarctica, and it goes through it, you know, through the what's visibly the top of Antarctica into India, which is the southern part, and then through Africa and into South America, just perfectly like a, if you fit the jigsaw puzzle, it fits yeah. perfectly. Same yeah. with animals like this one, um, this um, Lystrosaurus, and then these uh, um, dinosaur age animals here with, with their um, appearance on continents that, that only makes sense if it was all one land mass in, right. in greater antiquity. So you can probably pop off of this now. Okay. But, um, the whole point being we have a Pangea, right? Yeah. And so the highest mountain, you can't tell me that's, oh, he's only talking about one continent. No, no. Even non-Christian, anti-biblical historicity, secular professors and scientists will tell us that there is a Pangea. So it had to be one highest mountain and the water is X, you know, amount of feet or meters or however you want to measure it above um, that uh, mountaintop. Right. So that being the case, it's got to be a universal flood. Right. And... It only makes sense, to Tony, geologically, if this if this happened. Yeah. Maybe we can kind of leave leave this as a teaser for next time. And next time right. you have me, if if you and I both or one of us um, remembers, I, I'd like to put up a slideshow and walk through it. Sure. With, with with a demonstration in geological terms of how all this can fit with what we know of what what's on the Earth today, but only makes sense if there's a universal flood. And yet makes no sense whatsoever if right. there's only a local flood. That's right, true. right. And so just for everyone, if you're wondering what Pangea means, that Dr. Petrovich just mentioned. So Pangea, the word pan means all, gia, earth. So all earth meaning one landmass. Uh, Pangea simply means that the earth was all one landmass at one time. And that if you look at a map of, of the world, you'll notice it does look like a jigsaw puzzle. That, uh, that various continents fit with others, like South America fits at the bottom of the continent of Africa. And so uh, I would, I would uh, say that, Doug, that uh, something like the flood, and we, we underestimate the power of water. Hydraulics uh, is an incredible form of energy. Uh, I mean, they've done tests where they placed water into an, an iron, an iron can, a canister of iron, and you put it in a, a, a freezer, the water will actually burst through the iron. The, the, the freezing of the water will actually break the iron. Mm -hmm. and, and so we underestimate that in the book of Genesis, it says it's not just that the waters were coming down, but it says that there were the springs under the earth were bursting out. So there was cataclysmic, there's tsunamis going on, uh, cataclysmic earthquakes on the seabed and so forth. So we can understand why there was this rupture of all the, this landmass started to break apart and rupture. And it also brings about the... the as you mentioned, the Antarctica used to have lush vegetation. It also explains the 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 freezing of the of the poles of the north and south poles of the planet Earth. So mm -hmm. a lot of this, and I'm sure you will discuss that when we deal with geology. 
But isn't it interesting at the end of the flood that the Lord uh, gave us a sign? He put his his covenant sign of the rainbow, uh, which has been perverted and distorted uh, in our day by the LGBTQ community. They take this beautiful sign of God's covenant that he would never destroy the world uh, with a flood, which would make no sense, Ed, if it was a local flood, because we get tons of local floods. There was just one in Las Vegas. I don't know if you saw it. Yeah. Uh, talk to the Filipinos. They'll tell you about local monsoon floods every year. Yeah. And so if, if, if the flood was local, God has not been doing a good job of keeping his promise that he would never destroy the earth by a flood. If it's local, he, he's broken that promise many, many, many times because we, yeah. we continue to have local floods today. And Tony, let me end my thought on this topic sure. by coming full circle back to the Is Genesis history film, which my contribution yeah. was the Tower of Babel event. Yeah. In that film, I attempt to um, suggest, well, I suggest, and, and you know, I get very little airtime because there's so many other people that have to be interviewed, but um, th there's a separate DVD that was made that go that gives a fuller explanation of all of this that I offered that, that they put in this um, special DVD series. But anyway, um, so you can get that from the isgenesishistory.com website if you're interested. Um, but the, the the point is, uh, in my section, I try to prove or try to suggest, I don't have time to prove it even, that the original Babel of Genesis 11 is not the Babylon of Daniel's time. Right. The ba Babylon of Daniel's time was not occupied during the Uruk expansion which again, I'm connecting to the post babel dispersion. It, it was non-existent. It wasn't even a community, Babylon of Daniel's day. Right. But if you if you look at the ancient um, Mesopotamian sources, there are eight. You can count them. Eight at least eight ancient cities or sites. Yeah. That are called Babel. Oh, really? Yeah. Eight. So it's not just Babylon. It's, it's, oh wait, is there eight more? I, either there's eight more or eight in total, maybe even eight more. So there could be nine in total. Anyway, okay. um, among those, and this was all part of my process to try to figure out, okay, which one, if one of, the, okay, if Babylon wasn't inhabited at the time of the Tower of Babel events, then was, is there a candidate that works among the other, let's say, among the eight okay. possibilities? Um, and so I looked at all eight and it had to be occupied early enough in time and it had to come from, it had to be a site located in Southern Mesopotamia. Why? Southern Mesopotamia is known in the Bible as Shinar. Shinar, yeah. That's known in our historical studies today as Sumer because that's based on the Akkadian word Shumer. Shumer is Southern Mesopotamia. Um, basically bordering on the Persian Gulf. And at the time, it, it was at a much different position. It's receded far more than it was in greatest antiquity. But it used to be way up here. And so all these cities were on the coast and along the Euphrates River too, where the convergence, in fact, yeah. the site of Eridu is right on the convergence of, of the, um, the flow of the Euphrates River, not as we see it today, but as it originally was right. in that time when it dumps into the Persian Gulf, that's where Eridu was. Eridu is one of the eight. It's the only one that fits both qualifications, that it was occupied early enough and that it's located in Sumer. Guess what? That then makes you say, okay, it's the only candidate that can work. Let's study the site. So I bought the only existing um, archaeology book on the site of Eridu. And sure enough, it gives all of the information you need to fit everything you read in Genesis 11. But the whole point I wanted to come to is this. Um, if you look at the Sumerian king list, right? The Sumerian yeah. king yes. list. The first city that's known as a city um, that came down from heaven or from the sky, right. if you will, right. either way, however you want to translate it. Yeah. Um, first city that came down from heaven or from the sky and existed in ancient Mesopotamia was Eridu. Mm. Oh, it was? Yep, it was Eridu. Now, in that account, they attribute it to being a city before the flood. So they have pre-flood cities and they have post-flood cities. And they say that the king who ruled here 
live. I don't. I forget what it was like. It's in yeah, the ten, it's, tens of yeah, thousands. Of years. Astronomical, yeah, astronomical number. And I think that's just um, a an inflated number that reflects a reality of it's much longer. You know, it, the pre-flood time was much. You know, lifespans were much longer. Yes. Than they are after the flood. Right. right. And that's proof of it in my book. But anyway, right. going back to Eridu. Um, it's fascinating, Tony. Who is the patron deity at Eridu? It's Enki. Mm -hmm. Enki is the god of the sweet water Apsu, which is the underwater, I'm sorry, the un underground aquifers underneath the crust, the out outer crust of the land. And that is what, of course, you referred to as, you know, bubbling up and rising up at the time of the flood. And so that probably the vast majority of the water that floods the earth is coming from under the surface of the earth rather than coming down in the form of rain. Right. That being true, isn't it odd that Eridu, the world's first city, the Babel of Genesis 11, would be the city that it would have as its patron deity, the god of the underwater are the underground aquifers yes. that spring up on the earth at the time of the flood. Is that not amazing it of is. a connection? And all of that's going to be in my eventual um, book, Lord willing, on the third, third millennium biblical history. Oh, that's fascinating. That's great. So, folks, if there's any, uh, if you're interested in Dr. Petrovich's work, all the details are in the description box. Um, access to his various books are there as well. And so I would really encourage you to... Uh, to check out his material. Um, and so what we'll do then, uh, Doug, if, if it's okay with you, we'll just take some questions yeah, sure. uh, from our audience. Uh, I want to begin by first, uh, thank you, Evangelist Matthew, for your uh, your gift. Appreciate that. Um, let's move along here and let's see what we have here. A lot of a lot of commentary here uh, with, uh, with some of our viewers. Uh, Isaiah 53, thank you as well for your super sticker. God bless you for that. Um, okay, so let's take a look here. Uh, in terms of questions, we do have a question here. Uh, this is a question from, oops, let me try to bring, here we go, by Harriel uh, Johnson. Yes, I'd like to know how do you, th how old do you think the earth is, Doug? The word of God came to Noah and instructed him to build an ark using gopher wood and pitch, no built the ark as instructed by the word of God. So I guess the question here is, uh, is uh, the dating of the earth. Mm -hmm. How old do you think the earth is? Sure. <laughs> and I don't have the exact number ready at the moment. It's, it, it's going to be ready and finalized in my, um, in my book on third millennium biblical history. But I will tell you this, I'm fairly confident that the, the, the probably best number for the date for the universal flood is 3298 BC. So that's a number that I'm at this point confident about. I, I just haven't done the math yet in my own mind, looking at um, the biblical text and any textual variants that may be there to see if there's any um, reason for adjusting numbers or so forth. But I will do that research on my own and compare it um, to any other work that's out there that other people have done and come up with a conclusion that I'll put there. So. So basically, you know, you backtrack the whatever it is, the exact number, I don't know, the 2,000 odd years before that. So, you know, it's in the ballpark of uh, 32, uh, of um, 5298 BC, you know, more, you know, give or take a few centuries one way or the other. So that's probably where I'll end up landing. Um, and, and that for me is the age of the earth. Um, I'll tell you why that's significant, um, Harriel, because if you... Okay, and, and you could ask, how do I get that number 3298? It's based on how you, how you um, select your preferred textual variants in Genesis 11 in the chronologies where there's this almost universal 100 years of variance between, there's two main readings, one of the Hebrew Masoretic text and one of the uh, Septuagint um, and the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, which together hold the same view. Different manuscript traditions, but same view. Mm -hmm. And Hebrew text suggests that, let's say, and I'm just going to make up a number here. Let's say a certain patriarch, patriarch X, is 
35 years old when he bears his first son. And, um, and then he lives X amount of years, well, Y amount of years, and then he dies. And he's, he's Z years old when he died. Um, yeah. He, yeah, he lives X amount, is Y amount of years, and he, after the f- flood, no, after the son is born who's in that list, and then Z is, the, is his overall age, right? So that's the Masoretic text tradition. Well, if you look at the Samaritan Pentateuch LXX um, dual reading there, or or, um, or two manuscript traditions that are in, in, in agreement with one another, that same Patriarch X was not 35 years old when he had his son who was part of that genealogy, but he was 135 years old when he had that son who ended up in the genealogy. Mm-hmm. Now, then what happens is, and this is really um, telling, it's really important. Um, then if you go, if you go for the why, how, how many years did he live between the birth of that son and his death? It's a hundred years difference than the Masoretic text reading. It's a hundred years less, right? hundred years less. And then if you look at Z, how old was he, how old was he overall when he died? It's the same in the Masoretic text as it is in the LXX and the Samaritan Pentateuch. What that tells us is, this is not what we call in textual criticism, as Tony knows, a an accidental error. Mm-hmm. This is a what's what's called, what's termed an intentional error, meaning not that it was intentionally made wrong, but that some scribe along the way intentionally edited or changed the text to do what he was considering to be changing the text, to fixing a bad reading into a good reading. Right. And as Tony can probably vouch for, the number one most important canon of textual criticism or rule by which the game is played, how do you determine which textual variant is correct? Mm -hmm. You tend to favor, the number one rule is, you tend to favor the variant that best accounts for the rise of the other variants. So if you were a scribe of ancient Israel and you saw that this patriarch was 135 years old when he had his son that's in the list, and the next patriarch is 142 when he had his son, and the next patriarch is 163 when he has his son, you scratch your head and say, hmm, something's rotten in the state of Denmark. Probably the biblical writers got this wrong. I'm going to fix this problem because that doesn't work. You don't have sons when you're 135 and 142 and and whatever, but you do have them when you're 35 and when you're 42, that's, that works. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense that that scribe would change his text to say, let's reduce the birthing age of the, of the father in that list. And then let's make up for it by giving him the, same amount of overall years lived so that we're not changing his lifespan. So it's an educated, calculated change to the biblical text as it reads. And that makes perfect sense, that kind of change. Makes no sense. Um, um, let's see. Yeah. It makes no sense at all. If your text reads, you're the scribe, you're the ancient Israeli scribe, and it reads at, at 130. Uh, at no, at 35 years old, um, you know, this patriarch had his son, right? Wait, um, yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to change that intentionally to be 135. You're not going to say it's more logical if, um, if, if father X is, um, 135 years old when he has his child. That fits better. The readers are going to accept it more. It'll be more plausible. You're not going to change it that way. No way. You'd be kicked out of scribe school. You know, <laughs> your manuscript would be ripped into shreds. But it makes perfect sense if it goes the other way. So that's the rationale, the main rationale for why the Genesis 11 textual variants almost certainly read in such a way that the patriarch was 135 rather than 35. And what right. 
what happens when you see that and work with it is if you take all of the patriarchs with whom that applies and you extrapolate, it takes you back further in time when the original one of those patriarchs in the Genesis 11 chrono chronological list, genealogical list appears. So with the Masoretic text, you're looking at 2400 something BC for when the flood happened. But the problem with that, Tony, is that's after the um, pyramids are built. And there's no way in, no, nothing, po nothing in the realm of possibility to mm -hmm. allow for a universal flood to happen after the building of the pyramids. Yeah. No, it's no. got, the flood's got to be long before Prior. that. Yeah. So that fits, the history fits the Samaritan Pentateuch um, Septuagint reading in Genesis 11, but it doesn't fit the Masoretic text. So the, the biblical text works better with logic, right? In, in textual criticism, if you accept those readings and his history works better if you accept those readings. So that being the case, um, that gives us rationale for accepting 3298 BC as the time of the flood. Right, right. And 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 since you mentioned earlier, Doug, about uh, textual uh, criticism, maybe we can address the uh, you know the Masoretic reading that 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 well the rabbis actually claim that that Shem survived the flood, obviously. And that he actually lived until the time of Abraham, so that they identify him as Melchizedek, uh, and and so maybe I'm wetting some people's appetites here, but the, the rabbis taught that Melchizedek was actually Shem, the son of Noah, and and that's because there's been a lot of question about the Masoretes playing around with the numbers, with the the, the ages, and and so forth. So that's yeah. what you said there, Doug, really kindled my interest. But well, that'll be that'll be for another day. Sure. And, and by the way, I just noticed that you've been you've been fully Americanized now that you say Z instead yes. of Zed. And so you've lost the, the, the Canadian Commonwealth version of Zed. So it's more, it's Z, like ZZ Tops. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll still enjoy rooting for the uh, Blue Jays, I'll tell you. Yeah, that. They do, they've been doing quite well, actually. They have been. Yeah, they've been doing quite well. Okay, another question by Harriel Johnson. What about marsupials and, and God uh, and God showing his great sense of humor by creating the duck-billed platypus? So, yeah, I mean... Um, I mean, I guess he's asking about the marsupials, I, I, I guess, kangaroos and creatures of that sort in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I, I guess he's probably, I don't know if he's asking how they ended up in in uh, in, in Australia. I'm not sure if that's the, the that's the intent of the question. That I'm yeah. not sure. And, and I, I assume you're probably right on that, Tony. Um, and I would defer to someone out there like Todd Wood, who actually is a, a fellow... Um, scholar who appears in the Is Genesis History film. He'd be the perfect guy to answer this question. He is a biologist and he's been working on the kinds of animals as they come off of the um, ark. But um, the only thing I can say kind of semi-intelligently, let's say, in relation to this question is um, that Todd's perspective on what happens with the animals that are on the flood is that it's not as though every species or every form of every species has to appear on the flood, right? So it's not as though you're going to have Arabian stallions and you're going to have um, yeah. white tails and you're going to have, you know, all of the kinds of horses on the ark for this to work. No, but you had a kind of what he referred, what Todd Wood refers to as a Swiss army knife yeah. kind of animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it simply adapts to its environment. And so in the, you know, in the hotter places where it has to run more, it's going to be faster, it's going to have longer legs or whatever, and, you know, colder places, et cetera. So, um, so probably you have a lot of Swiss army knives coming off the arc, if you will, and then God allowing those kinds to develop according to their um, climates and their um, habitats um, that are native to them. And, you know, some things die off, others don't. Um, some new things develop in certain places that don't develop elsewhere. So that's how we can, I think, work out all of the kinds. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's pretty uh, humorous that God would, you know, allow a marsupial such as this um, in, um, in, our, in Australia that he doesn't put anywhere else in the world. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that it survives. That's God's well, sense of humor at work. When the English settlers, when they, they went to Australia and they saw, when they reported the platypus, the people back in England were saying, you're insane. Uh, what type of a creature has the body of a beaver and, and the bill of a duck? And so it's quite interesting that uh, the the early English, uh, the, the, well, the, the English settlers there in Australia, uh, when they reported on that, they, it was met with unbelief that that mm -hmm. how could such a creature exist? But that is the beauty of God's of God's creation. And, so, and Tony, yeah. doesn't that make sense? Because um, we tend to judge the past by the present, mm -hmm. and that's one of the that's one of the themes that that screams out of the Is Genesis history film is. We can't judge the past by the present. Right. We have to judge the present by the past. Right. And try right. to figure out how that works. But we're foolish to say, you know, X, Y, and Z can't happen in the past because of what we see now. Right. Right. Very true. Well, Harry always mentions uh, uh, the, the, my uh, my uh, home here, the, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, uh, truce. I know you love hockey, though, brother, and that's good enough for me. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Toronto Maple Leafs. They're as I said, I said yesterday in, a, in the live stream yesterday, uh, Doug, that so the last time the Leafs won the cup was back in 1967, mm -hmm. when I was born. And mm -hmm. so, since I was born, the Leafs have never won the cup. So I don't know. I don't know if my birth had something, to, <laughs> something to do uh, with it. But Tony, yeah, I can say I out Trump you here. Okay, um, my infamy with my number one team. I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and I was, I'm a lifetime Cleveland Browns football fan. Okay. Football. Okay. And my team, the Browns, they haven't, they never won a Super Bowl to, to date. And the, the last time they won a championship was in 1964, the year I was born. So there you go. that's even greater infamy. Yeah. There's something about us Canadians. We seem to offset things in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So it seems, um, uh, it, Harry, I'll just mention, I thought I've, th I've thoroughly enjoyed the session. Yes, two Babylon ba Babylonian three, actually one, one to cone. I heard not sure what, I'm not sure if I'm missing something there, uh, Doug. Mm -hmm. I, I, I yeah, I didn't catch on either. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let me glad see. You enjoyed it, though. Yeah. Glad you enjoyed it. Harry. Question here from, uh, uh, Michael, my good friend, Michael. Have you read the book by Dr. Terry Mortensen? Where did the millions of years come from? Hmm. I think I've heard of that book, but have not read it yet. No. So, um, yeah, you can always write in with your thoughts on it. If you have that, and maybe um, Tony could pass that on to me. I'd be interested yeah. to see, you know, what your thoughts are if you've read it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, apologies well, there. Harriel makes a good point here. Uh, he does mention Melchizedek had no beginning or end of life, no genealogy. We we and we know Shem's parents. We know it was Noah, and and his wife. Uh, whereas Melchizedek, um, what we can say about Melchizedek uh, having no beginning or end of life, it doesn't mean Melchizedek is he's a he's a Christ-like figure. He's a he's a type of Christ. The son, he is like the Son of God, but mm -hmm. the reason why in Hebrews 7 he said not to have genealogy is because we don't have a genealogy of Melchizedek in right. the book of Genesis, right? As you know, uh, as you know, Doug, Melchizedek only appears twice in the Hebrew Bible, Genesis 14 and then Psalm 110, where the Messianic king is said to be a priest forever mm -hmm. after the order of Melchizedek. But, yes. um, but anyway, the, the reference to Melchizedek not having father or mother, no beginning of days, no end of days, is a reference to the fact we don't have a genealogy. And so in that respect, the author of Hebrews sees uh, a connection, a type, if you will, between Melchizedek and, yeah, and Jesus and Christ. And Tony, I'll just add too that if my perspective on the chronology of Old Testament history is right, and the flood happens in about 3298 BC, yeah. then Shem has to be dead. Yeah. By the time that Melchizedek meets with Abraham, exactly. Right? So, exactly. you know, uh, that that possibility would pretty much have to be thrown right out the window. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, I mean, yeah, yeah. But. Well, um, Doug, I want to thank you so much for for coming on tonight, and uh, that was a lot of uh, a lot to digest. Uh, but uh, thanks again. Really appreciate you and your ministry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Tony. Um, thank you for all who who watched live or who will watch this um, by recording. 
Um, we had a great time, and I, I appreciate your uh, willingness to stick it out and uh, hope this gives you food for thought and hope you have um, an exciting future of study of God's Word um, um, you know, in the days ahead. And keep looking for future episodes that Tony's going to upload and future work that I have. My, my work will be on academy.edu. Um, anything that's free that I can put up there is up there. You can go download journal articles I've written and so forth and get teaching sources and so forth. So um, lots of great resources there, both from me and from hundreds of thousands of other scholars out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and once again, folks, uh, there's information on uh, in the description box if you want uh, more information on Dr. Petrovich and his work and his ministry. Uh, just uh, take, a, take a gander at those links that are provided for you in the description box. So folks, thanks again for joining us. We appreciate you being with us and giving up your time. And uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, keep asking questions. Uh, never be afraid to ask questions. God created us with a mind uh, and, and he's not afraid of your questions. He's not uh, insulted by your questions. He invites us to come and reason together says the Lord, though your sins are red as, as crimson, they shall be white as well. Though they're red as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And that's the promise that we have in Christ. And so uh, thanks again, everybody. God bless you and uh, look forward to seeing you in uh, future episodes.